Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Uh, we are glad to see you here. And, uh, you know, I've really been looking forward to this episode because I think, uh, in fact, I know that some of you have been commenting already about the topic tonight on YouTube, on Facebook. So this is going to be a really great show. We are going to talk about, if you hadn't guessed by my backdrop here, Paul is Live, the live album from 1993, as my cohorts here are, are showing you <laughs> right now, the CD and the LP, you know we have the formats all covered for you on this show. And uh, so we will get to that in just a little bit, and I'm sure all of you out there are going to have something to say about the album. So, uh, so as I said, this is this is going to be a great show tonight. Um, so uh, before we get to all that, though, let me introduce myself and my good friends that I have the fortune of, uh, of hosting this show with every other week. I'm Kid O'Toole. I am the author of Songs We Are Singing, Guided Tours to the Beatles, Lesser Known Tracks, Michael Jackson FAQ, All That's Left to Know About the King of Pop, and I'm also the co-host of the monthly show, Toppermost of the Poppermost. So uh, let's see, how shall I start here? Well, let me start with uh, the one of the more popular U uh, channels on YouTube. Um, he covers, oh gosh, um, Beatles news, uh, his adventures in collecting. He does very popular live streams. Uh, he also has another channel where he covers his other passion, which is film. You all know him as Mean Mr. Mayo, but we all know him here as Joe Mayo. Joe, how are you doing tonight? Doing pretty good, Kit. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Oh, of course, of course. Um, you know him as one of the legs of the very popular podcast and video cast, Two Legs, which is about everything Paul McCartney from the solo years and occasionally the Beatles years as well. He is your friend and mine, Tom Hanyadi. Tom, how are you doing tonight? It, it's a pleasure being here as always, Ken, Joe. Let's get this episode off the ground, shall we? Uh <laughs> Yeah, at least at least in in in, in name only because yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't see that I, track. I I see what you did there, Tom. Very very good. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, I mean everybody knows this gentleman. He is one of the busiest men in the Beatles fandom. He hosts the very popular syndicated show Every Little Thing, where he plays just that. Every little thing in the solo years, the Beatles years, um, you name it. He also um, hosts the popular, also very popular YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. You will, you just don't know what will turn up. Maybe one of us, an author, a musician, you just never know. Um, and so you just have to tune in and find out. And also the extremely popular podcast, things we and video cast, I should say, things we said today, and you never know who will pop up there as well. So, uh, so give it up, show your love for Ken Michaels. Ken, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Kit. Good to see you, Tom and Joe. It's like a pop up video. <laughs> Yes, and the three of you have been on my channel, and hopefully you'll be returning anytime Any, soon. Anytime, anytime. We anytime we love it. All. Anytime at all. That's right. All you got to do is call. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, people. Let's get this thing started. Oh, wow. This is great. We could do this all night. <laughs> yeah. But but we, we have to stop because, of course... We've got the news, and Ken is the man with the news. So, Ken, Great. tell us I'm, what's what goes on. Because I'm looking for changes, so let's talk about something else. <laughs> well, there's plenty of changes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, first of all, we must say congratulations. Goes out to Sean Lennon and Yoko Ono, both executive producers for War Is Over. Inspired by the music of John and Yoko, which won an Oscar 
for Best Animated Short Film. Filmmakers Dave, uh, Dave Mullins and Brad Booker took the stage alongside Sean, who noted Yoko's recent 91st birthday. And with Mother's Day being that day in the UK, or as we celebrate it in May, uh, Sean wished his mother a happy Mother's Day and asked the audience to say happy Mother's Day, Yoko, which they all did. So happy for Sean getting this acknowledgement. Uh, for the new film. Paul McCartney will be performing for a tribute concert for Jimmy Buffett, taking place April 11th at the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles to be called Keep the Party Going, a tribute to Jimmy Buffett. There will be a star-studded cast along with Paul, including the Eagles, Jackson Brown, John Bon Jovi, Zach Brown, Brandy Carlisle, Kenny Chesney, Cheryl Crow, and others. Tickets for the show went on sale last Friday, uh, March 15th at 1 p.m. through Ticketmaster. I certainly hope this is going to be streamed. I'd love to see this. Yeah, me too. That's quite a lineup. Oh, yeah. I uh, just found out about this yesterday. Mark Knopfler has put together uh, an amazing cast of 54 great guitarists for a charity single to record his song, Going Home, the theme from Local Hero to raise funds for Teenage Cancer Trust and Teen Cancer America. Uh, Mark has tapped Eric Clapton, Pete Townsend, Slash, David Gilmore, Tony Iommi, Alec Lifeson, Bruce Springsteen, Joe Walsh, Ronnie Wood, Steve Lukather, Peter Frampton, Joan Jett, and many more in what he's dubbing Mark Knopfler's Guitar Heroes. And notably, the song opens with the last recorded guitar track by the late Jeff Beck. Hmm. Paul McCartney is not listed among the guitarists. Ringo Starr and his son Zach Starkey both play drums on the song. Roger Daltrey, who happens to be a Teenage Cancer Trust honorary patient, uh, patron, plays harmonica for the song. He's also the co-founder of Teen Cancer America with Pete Townsend, by the way. And Sting contributes his bass playing. The artwork for this single is done in Sgt. Pepper style and is done by none other than Peter Blake, who co-created the sleeve design for the Beatles' iconic album. The song was released on March the 15th, and it's available as physical versions on CD, deluxe CD, Blu-ray, and vinyl. Funds benefit the Teenage Cancer Trust and Teen Cancer America and are available to order on Mark Knopfler's Guitar Heroes website. And Kit is going to be so nice as to provide the link in our description box if you want to check out the song. It's almost 10 minutes long. Oh, wow. Great guitar playing all throughout. This will make Tom very happy. The sequel to This Is Spinal Tap is now in production. Almost 40 years to the day that the original film debuted in movie theaters in March of 1984. The film is shooting in New Orleans with Rob Reiner directing, with Christopher Guest, Harry Shearer, and Michael McKean reprising their iconic roles. And as Rob Reiner revealed in a podcast last November, Paul McCartney, Elton John, and Garth Brooks uh, will be making cameo appearances in the film. Questlove and Trisha Yearwood were just added to the guest list of cameos. The film sees the band reunite for one concert after taking a 15-year hiatus, and Ryder will once again take on the role as documentarian Martin Marty DeBergy. Tom's been waiting for this moment. Hey, I'm really excited about the sights, the sounds, and the smells. <laughs> Smell the glove. Yep. And this, this one will go up to 12. This one will go up to 12. <laughs> This Friday, uh, there will be a celebration of the 60th anniversary of the release of John Lennon's first book in his own right, taking place at the Liverpool Beatles Museum on Matthew Street. We've already reported that Julian Lennon and Billy Mumy will be among the contributors for the event. Since then, we've learned two more people we can add to that list it will be Brian May and Susie Quattro. Um, just saying that they're contributors. I'm not sure if they're actually going to show up there physically or not. But it's nice to know that they're acknowledging the book. Um, according to Music Tap, BNG will be releasing a deluxe edition of the compilation Let It Roll, the songs of George Harrison. The music found on the collection will be from the 2009 remaster. But the new version will have a 28-page booklet with liner notes, and it's packaged in a four-panel digipack. The song list is still exactly the same with no bonus tracks. 
But it's still nice to know that this release is being reissued. The release date for this is April the 26th. Many thanks to Scott O'Rourke for handing me this information. News from Peter Hicks that the coffee table size book plan for John Lennon's Mind Games box set will be delayed until September 24th. But the box set as it stands is still a June release. And it was just announced today. I know a lot of Beatle fans or Jeff Lynn fans. He has announced his over and out final tour. This is a North American tour, 27 dates running from August the 24th in Palm Desert, California through October the 25th in Los Angeles. It is possible that they'll add more dates and additional legs before it ends. Tickets actually go on sale this Friday. Although I heard there's going to be a pre-sale on Wednesday. 25 U.S. dates, two in Canada, in Vancouver and uh, Ontario. All right. So uh, something to look forward to. I know Kit's told me that uh, she's seen Jeff Lynn. I've seen him in concert. Well, actually, I go back to, uh, what was it? Out of This World, the double album. Was that the one? The Yellow oh. Show from, was oh. Out of This World? yeah i think so yeah uh, if you if you have not seen him run do not walk to get tickets i uh, i saw him and i can't remember if it was like 2015 16 something like that when he came to chicago and it was one of the best shows i've ever seen uh you know he plays all the hits sounds incredible do not miss it you, yeah you will love it and the last time i saw him danny harrison opened for him with the new number two and they signed wow. it sound and the mix was was just great yeah same here all right on your telly <laughs> this thursday on pbs stations uh i know channel 13 in new york will be airing the concert for george at 8 30 p.m they usually do this when they have their pledge drives but uh every time it's on pbs it's like an event in our house and we have to watch it even though we have the dvd some book news. Expect a new book coming out in a few months from Terry Crane, who is best known for putting out the book NEMS and the business of selling Beatles merchandise in the U.S. from 1964 to 66. That was in 2019. The new one is called Copywriting the Beatles. I asked Terry, could you give me a description of what this book is all about? And he just emailed me and he wrote, the task of documenting Beatles and Beatles-related copyrights is a daunting one. The author of this book has assembled as detailed a book as possible. This book chronicles over 900 Beatles and Beatles-related copyrights from 1963 to 66. In the annuals of the Library of Congress, there are Beatles and Beatles-related copyrights for musical screenplays, lectures, spoken word writings, dolls, Beatle records, newspaper artwork, paintings, drawings, articles, toys, posters, albums, sculptures, jewelry, portraits, magazines, record cases, sheet music, novelty <laughs> records, television scripts, newspaper cartoons, impromptu skits, books, photographs, document uh, documentary scripts, satire animations, cover records in French, Dutch, Spanish, and German, and more. This reference publication details the copyrights in chronological order, making it easy to follow the growth of this wild and wacky genre. Don't ever say they're not finding new things to come up with in Beatle books. <laughs> this is entirely new, a whole new approach. And uh, God bless Terry Crane for, for taking this on. My God. If anyone can do it, it's Terry. Uh -huh. Okay, and that book on NEMS and, and the Beatles memorabilia is fantastic. Yeah, it's great. It's just uh, so thorough, and everything that came out in the U.S. is covered in there. We just found out today that they just released in the U.K. the book called Real Love. 500 Beatles solo cover versions that you must hear. Okay, it's by Peter Chaxfield. It is just what the title says. Cover versions of solo Beatles songs described as famous and obscure, good and bad, new and old, as well as the artists behind them, along with nearly 50 exclusive interviews. This book has come out in paperback. I'm going to be looking forward to that. Luca Parasi, who's been working on his follow-up to uh, his most recent book called Music is Ideas, has a new one coming out. 
and it's going to cover well the first book went from 1970 to 1989 and the follow-up is from 1990 through 2022 i believe mm -hmm. it's coming up very soon and he's also just released a brand new book on ban on the run mm -hmm. and i'll know more about that very soon okay but luca does outstanding work it's been a yep. guest on my on my channel and uh with tom yep. and what has he been on our show no <laughs> but he should we should oh, we yeah. should get him on sometimes i forget between this show and things we i said. know but yeah we should get him on our show all right a few things i have to note here and that's three major passings first of all uh johnny gentle who was uh, born John Eskew in Liverpool in 1936. Johnny will best be known for having the Beatles, then known as the Silver Beatles, as his backup band for a tour of Scotland. This was for seven shows from May 20th to the 28th in 1960. And this was arranged by concert promoter Larry Parnes. It was the Beatles' first professional tour. This is before they went to Hamburg. Then consisting of John Paul George, Stu Sutcliffe, and drummer Tommy Moore, they were each paid 18 pounds per week. This was only a week. Um, it was on this tour that the Beatles adopted stage names. Paul was Paul Ramon, George was Carl Harrison, John was Long John, and Stu was Stuart DeSteel, or DeStale. The name of the group wasn't even listed in the publicity for the tour. It was simply Johnny Gentle and his group. It was not a pleasant experience for the Beatles, a poorly arranged set of dates. And on May 23rd, Gentle, perhaps having a little too much alcohol, drove their van and carrying the group from Inverness to Fraserburg into the back of a stationary Ford Poplar, shaking up two elderly women in the car. But a guitar flew right into Tommy Moore's face and he had to be taken to the hospital. And that night, sedated in bed, with a concussion and losing several front teeth, John Lennon hauled him out of bed, insisting that he play on stage behind his drum kit. Oh. Larry Parnes had helped Johnny get a record contract in 1959 with Phillips Records and gave him the stage name of Johnny Gentle. He released two singles and an EP, which proved to be unsuccessful. Another three singles followed, again with no success. While on the tour with the Beatles, Johnny reportedly wrote a song that John Lennon helped him finish called I've Just Fallen for Someone, in which John is said to have written the bridge. The song was released by Adam Faith for his second album, and Johnny Gentle recorded the song under a new stage name, Darren Young. He released it as a single on Parlophone in 1962, again with no success. He later joined a group called The Viscounts in 1964, and in 1998 he wrote a book, Johnny Gentle and the Beatles, first ever tour and he made occasional appearances at beetle conventions johnny gentle died on february 29th on your birthday kit at the age of 87 okay he'll always have a big part of beetle history just because of that first big major tour as i said the beetles very first professional tour also tony clark has passed away he started working at Abbey Road in 1964, later becoming the senior engineer and producer there. He worked with the Beatles, Paul and Wings, Cliff Richard, the group Sky, Olivia Newton John, and Fella Cootie. Um, and um, if you listen to the very beginning of Mumbo from Wildlife, you hear Paul say, Take it, Tony. Well, that was Tony Clark he was referring to. Okay. And, uh, Thanks to Luca Parasi, who on his Facebook page posted that. I didn't even know that Tony Clark had passed away. And obviously, we have to close with the major passing of Eric Carmen. Music fans and Beatle fans were shocked of the news, as I was, um, of his passing. Known for his time as the main lead singer and songwriter for the Raspberries, and later for a very successful solo career, Born in Cleveland, Ohio, who was a classically trained pianist and self-taught guitar player. With the Raspberries, he scored major hits like Go All the Way, I Want to Be With You, Let's Pretend, and Overnight Sensation. As a solo artist, a blockbuster hit for him in 1976 with All By Myself. So beatle -y. 
that song. But then you could say that about those hits with the raspberries. In fact, that guitar solo and all by myself is so George Harrison-esque. And that was Hugh McCracken that played that, by the way. Yeah. Not all by myself. Um, Never Gonna Fall in Love Again, big hit. She Did It, Change of Heart, Hungry Eyes from the Dirty Dancing soundtrack, Make Me Lose Control. He also co-wrote the song Almost Paradise um, from the Footloose soundtrack. I which, love that song. That's yeah, a great yeah. band. It was Ann Wilson and Mike Reno yeah. that sang on yeah. that. Plus, he wrote two major hits, both top tens for Sean Cassidy. That's rock and roll and Hey Deanie. The Beatles' influence can certainly be heard in Eric's music, and uh, especially you listen to the Raspberries and his solo music. You'll note the Beatles, the Beach Boys, and the Who in there. Uh, musician and writer for Beatle Fan Magazine, Ken Sharp, wrote a biography on the Raspberries released in 1993 called Overnight Sensation, The Story of the Raspberries. And in the year 2000, Eric was a member of Ringo Starr and his all-star band. Eric said, quote, I had met Ringo various times in the past when I heard he was going to do another tour and he wanted to know if I was interested in doing this. I was so thrilled. And the quote there, the touring uh, iteration of the band also featured, of course, Ringo on drums, Jack Bruce from Cream on bass, Dave Edmonds on guitar and Simon Kirk from Free and Bad Company co-drumming with Ringo. Eric said, you have a Beatle, a member of Cream and Dave Edmonds. Dave Edmonds is one of my favorite guitarists and producers. What else can I say? I can't imagine saying no to a Beatle. <laughs> Raspberries reunited for a mini tour in 2005. I got to see them at BB Kings in New York City, and I interviewed Eric, and I interviewed their drummer Jim Von Fonte, and I had a great time doing that. Um, in 2017, Omnivore Records released a live album from the Raspberries uh, called Pop Art Live from uh, their reunion concert in 2004 from Cleveland's House of Blues. And apart from their Raspberries material, they also covered the Beatles songs, Babies in Black, No Reply, and Ticket to Ride. On March the 11th, Eric's wife Amy announced that Eric passed away in his sleep over the previous weekend and no cause of death was given. Eric Carmen was 74. Um, any of you big fans of Eric Carmen? Well, I mean... You can't deny the, I, I mean, all by myself. I mean, the, I remember the first time I heard that song, I was just blown away. And, and as a teenager, I just, I recognized, you know, how powerful that, that, that track was. And I continue to, to love that song, love that song to this day. Um, you know, the, the, and he had a little success in the eighties as well too, but all by myself. I mean, that for me is a song he should be remembered for personally myself. Oh, I think he'll always be remembered for that. And some of these other songs, too. Yeah. I mean, I still hear Hungry Eyes all the time on stations that play 80s music. So uh, Make Me Lose Control and Almost Paradise. Yeah. So. Yeah, because um, I was going to say for, for us Gen Xers, you know, probably, uh, I mean, all by myself is probably what he'll be most remembered for. But for us Gen Xers, yeah, we were probably most introduced to him through the Dirty Dancing soundtrack with Hungry Eyes. I mean, that song was everywhere when, yeah. when that movie came out. And it was a great song. Uh, and then the following year, I think, was when Make Me Lose Control came out because he had such a, you know, kind of a career resurgence uh, after uh, that. And and, uh, and a great and I, mullet, too. A great mullet. A great mullet. Great mullet. You know, <laughs> well, it's the 80s. You know, you had to, had to you know, get with the times. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I went back and, and listened to that song. And actually, uh, Lawrence Juber uh, posted a yeah. link to that video. And, and I didn't realize that he was on that that record and, and even mm. in the video. I yeah. didn't... Yep. He said he played on the record, and if you look closely uh, in the video, there are a couple of shots of, of Eric uh, Carmen, you know, singing in, in the studio uh, with his band, and there are a couple of quick shots of Lawrence Juber. He has shorter hair, uh, <laughs> but uh, but there he is. And, uh, you know, so that was that was a nice, nice bonus. Uh, and I did not know until tonight that he co-wrote Almost Paradise. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Uh, that's another great song from the 80s that right. Gen Xers remember fondly. Um, so, And I told um, Tom that I didn't know that Eric, uh, Eric Herman first wrote and recorded a song that Olivia Newton-John fans yeah, uh, showed right. you know, 
yeah, called Boats Against the Current uh -huh. uh, from Olivia Newton-John's Totally Hot album. And, and I, I played that, that album to death when, when I was a kid. And that's a beautiful song. Uh, and I listened to the original, the Eric Carmen's original, and that's a real, I mean, his version is wonderful too. Yeah. Um, so so uh, Eric Carmen, you know, really wrote a lot of songs that you may not know that that he wrote. So, you know, what a talent. Yeah. Not only that, but if if you got to see the Ringo tour with Eric in it, when he did all by myself, he did the full version of the song, which is something like six, seven minutes long. And it was very much influenced by Rachmaninoff. And he has this whole piano solo in the middle of it. And he plays it so well. And I'm pretty sure that was Ringo wasn't there on stage. That was one of the, the big moment moments on stage when one of the stars has a long song and Ringo takes a break. But um, yeah, he was a great piano player, yeah. very much influenced by classical music, too. And um, one thing I'll always remember about when I did get to interview Eric and, and Jim um it's something I wanted to say so badly to them. And Let's Pretend is one of my favorite songs of all time from the Raspberries. It's a beautiful melody. Eric's voice goes way up high. <laughs> it's, it's incredible how, how, how high he goes. Um, but I said to him, to me, that's like the greatest song that, that Paul McCartney and Brian Wilson didn't write together. <laughs> you know, if the two of them, if Paul and Brian Wilson could write something, I'd imagine it would be something as great and powerful as Let's Pretend. But there's so many other great songs in the catalog, in his catalog between the Raspberries and his solo stuff, but definitely explore it if you can. Tremendous talent there that we lost. And that is all the news I have for you. Right. Thank you, Ken. Okay. A lot, lot of stuff happened since uh, the last uh, show we did. My goodness. Um, all right. Well, let's get to our main topic for tonight, which is uh, about Paul is Live, as I mentioned earlier. And I don't think we've done uh, many live albums on our show. I don't think we've George, talked about we did the any. George Japan one. Oh, that's right. George and Japan. You're right. So, yeah. So, this is probably only the second. Uh, so, probably only the second we've done. Um, and uh, this is an interesting one. Um, and judging, as I mentioned at the top of the show, from the comments we've already gotten, um, it's, it's an album that's kind of split fans. Um, and uh, so this will be, I think, a fascinating conversation tonight. Um, so to just sort of set the scene, uh, as it were, this uh, came along in 93. And of course, it was um, in the wake of the Off the Ground album. And this was the New World Tour that uh, he was doing to promote the album. And um, it was... Mainly, uh, the the songs came from the American uh, tour dates, although there were some included here from Australia. Uh, the lineup was mostly from the 89-90 tour, with the exception of the drummer, um, who this time, instead of uh, Chris Witten, was Blair Cunningham. And uh, But otherwise, it was, you know, identical lineup. Um, the set list was, uh, you know, pretty different. Uh, obviously, no songs from Flowers in the Dirt this time around. It was a mixture of Beatles and Wings, but also, obviously, off-the-ground songs. Uh, the cover artwork, as you see behind me, was a parody of uh, Abbey Road. And yes, you can see it a bit clearly here. Uh, Tom's holding up the LP version. Um, and it's, of course, a parody of The Paul is Dead, rumors even the title of the album paul is live you know paul is alive haha and um and I, we were talking about before the show i realized with shock that paul at this point was only a year younger than i am now that he recorded this album and at the time when i bought this which i was probably 21 um i thought he was so much older <laughs> he's recording this like oh he's really older when he's 
when he was touring at that point. Oh my goodness. Um, so that, that kind of knocked me off my feet when I realized this. So, um, so the album comes out and, uh, it received mixed reaction, um, from, uh, critics and fans at the time, because it only came out a couple of years after tripping the live fantastic. Uh, the uh, live album after the 89-90 tour. So it was, why did he need to put out another live album so soon after the last one? And so we're going to be talking about that as well as the album as a whole um, and where we think this fits in with Paul's canon. So, and of course, we want to know what you guys think um, out there. What do you think of the, the album and how, you know, over 30 years after it was released, um, you know, what do you think of it now? So let's start out with the tour itself uh, because um, I didn't get to see the New World Tour because Paul skipped Chicago and I'm, I'm not bitter, um, <laughs> but <laughs> not bitter at all. Um, but he skipped Chicago on this leg. So um, did any of you guys see this this tour so uh so tom i see you nodding so why don't we start with you did you see what, what were your impressions of this tour I, I, I sure did see it we saw it uh the pontiac silver dome which is uh damn near near a thousand ninety thousand people you can fit in that place so it's a massive wow. it was a massive football stadium where the detroit lions used to play and um I, it was just massive getting in their stadium. And, and, you know, I think it ended up being just shy of 50,000 people attended. So, I mean, it was, it was packed and a lot of people, we, me, me and my, uh, my uncle and two aunts, we were on the ground level, but you know, pretty far back. So, you know, it wasn't the best seats, but they weren't bad either. So, I mean, we got a pretty good view. So, but it was a very exciting time. I mean, listen, I mean, the, the past eight years I was listening to pretty much nothing, but, you know, Beatles, Paul McCartney, John, George, and Ringo. So, uh, you know, to finally get to see one of them live after being disappointed and, you know, my my parents and the stepdad at the time, you know, wouldn't allow me to go, you know, you know, uh, an hour away to go see him in 89, but uh, whatever. Um, but, uh, but yeah, 20 years old and uh, just finally just, you know, there's an opportunity to see him and it, it, it was great. Um, you know, I, I, I honestly, you know, I wasn't too excited about, you know, the songs on that he played that were on the album, but you know, that's, that's just my, my issue I got to deal with. But, uh, but other than that, um, I was really excited about the songs he played. Uh, the, the electricity in the building was, was high, you know, the excitement, uh, you know, watching people as, as they, you know, as they're watching Paul as well, you know, my uncle told, you know, begged me to stop singing because I was singing the whole time. Don't you sing know? during the concert. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, you know, I what? don't want to hear you sing. Yeah, well, hey, I got a red video idea. Yeah. There you go. There you go. But you know what? I bought the ticket. I'll sing if I want. And everybody else around you. <laughs> and, and the crowds are louder now than they were yeah. in that. Oh, yeah. Right. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was nothing. Now, was this, uh, your, was this your first time seeing him? Yeah. This is the okay, first time seeing first him. Time. Yeah. Okay. And then this is the T-shirt that I – it's not the exact one that I bought. I mean, that one mm -hmm. wouldn't fit anymore. But uh, <laughs> I had to get a bigger one. But, uh, you know, very – it's all contemporary, you know, with the aging musician standing in front of a chain. Uh you know, <laughs> just very, he just... wasn't he wasn't aging then damn it he wasn't no, he was I young mean, I, right i don't right? get the concept of the t-shirt with you know him standing next to a hanging chain i i just don't get it but it was the best shirt that i thought that they had so um but uh <laughs> but yeah i mean all and listen i had a fantastic time and you know i loved every second of it um so i, I mean i wasn't able to compare it to the 89 90 tour but we'll we'll compare that you know the the, the live album to to the trip in the live fantastic in you know a little bit but you know it, I was in heaven that night. Yep, I bet, I bet. So now, Ken, did you see that uh, that uh, tour as well? Yeah, I saw him at Giant Stadium, and at the time I was doing my radio show on WDHA in New Jersey, and I actually gave a few live reports. While the concert was going on, I was in a special booth right there witnessing the thing. And I keep remembering that <laughs> I used the word perfect many times <laughs> in my review because I was 
really blown away at the quality of Paul singing. Um, in some ways, when I listened to Tripping the Lie Fantastic, and I was at, I don't know, three shows in 89 at Madison Square Garden, where I thought his voice was really rough. And and listening to the CD, sometimes I feel it's way too rough. I thought his voice was much better in 1993. And that really impressed me. And I was so much in a daze when I heard Another Day. Yeah. You know, um, I was so thrilled that he did that song. Um, I'm not sure if I remember if I knew the set list before I, before I went to the show. Of course, nowadays you know it, all, unless you go to the first show. Um, but I was really impressed with the set list. And to this day, when I see a new McCartney show, a new tour, I want the set list to be very different from the previous tour. And in, in this regard, it, it didn't disappoint. So I really enjoyed this, this show in particular at Giant Stadium, because I think the band was on fire and Paul sounded so good vocally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is interesting to note how how different this set was than mm -hmm. than the eighty nine ninety tour. Uh, you know, really, really was. Uh, you know, kind of forgotten about that until I listened to this. And yeah, he had really changed it up. Absolutely. I also. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Say, you were talking about how there was only three years between Tripping the Life Fantastic and this. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, Unplugged came out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's so, right. There was three live releases within three years that's that's mm -hmm. a lot yep yeah i'd kind of forgotten to throw that in because i you know don't see that as like a big concert you know but that's right that was a live performance right. so that's true so there was that I too mean, it's actually four if you if you count of the course. highlights of, of uh oh, right. highlights as well so yep mm. yeah the highlights one that's right exactly so Absolutely. Um, Joe, did you see that uh, that tour? I just didn't want well, to. Oh, sure. I saw the tour. <laughs> yes. All right. So so what were your impressions? <laughs> well, I saw it at Giant Stadium. With Ken saw it. Um, I'd seen him already. This was my sixth time seeing him, but it's cheating because if he said I saw him twice at Madison Square Garden in 89, twice at Giant Stadium in 1990. Mm -hmm. Then I got the, the tickets, the free tickets I won to up close for MTV right. where I was almost up right up to the stage standing there, which was fantastic. Uh, so this was technically my sixth time. And uh, one thing I was going to say, which Ken had, had mentioned, I agree with is that I, I remember thinking that Paul's voice was a little rough uh, in, in, in the first time I saw him. I was wondering, and, and it's also on the album. He said, you could hear it on tripping the life. Fantastic. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's funny. Uh, this time I did think he he was in better voice. And, uh, you know, I agree with all that. And the, the band was hot. What I remember about it the most is that as far as like going to stadiums, it's probably the best stadium seats that I had. Um, I never really got anything clo really close. Um, but this time it was as close as I, as I was to get at a, at a stadium show. And they had it the crane coming around where you see them standing on this crane platform or something with railing around it. And it went right over the audience and went on over, you know, over me. Mm. Well, that was, you know, it's kind of silly now when I think of it, like oh. you come out that way. But at the time I thought it was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kit, you had mentioned uh, that some of the, the reviews may have said something like why another live album or something. And it's, well, because there's different songs on it, for one thing, different tour, different album he's promoting. In this case, Off the Ground, which, unlike Tom, I know that's not one of his favorites. Um, I like Off the Ground. It's not, I wouldn't put it up in my top five or anything, but I do like Off the Ground uh, quite a bit. So I was happy to see him do some of the songs from there, you know, which I had already seen him kind of premiere when I saw it at the Ed Sullivan Theater when he did the... Uh, up close for MTV and the, the album hadn't even been out yet, you know? So yeah. uh, at that point when I saw the up, MTV up close, so yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. It was, it was a good show. I remember liking it maybe even more than when I saw him at Madison square garden in 89. And th that had been my first time seeing him. So that was, or, you know, 
the draw. That was what was exciting about it in, in 89. But I just thought it was maybe a better show. I could nitpick and say, hey, look, I'm glad I got it. I got to see him do drive my car. Just looking for stuff to talk about. It's never been my favorite opener, personally. I kind of like Hello Goodbye or um, what's the other one? The Magical Mystery Tour. I don't know. I kind of like those, you know, kind of welcome Magical Mystery Tour or Hello, you know, everybody as my favorite. So I never really like drive my car as much for an opener. But yeah, yeah that's what I have to say about that. Okay. Can I, can I add quick, Queen? Yeah. Uh, it, it, listen, it, it's not a rare thing for an act to release live albums close together. Okay. Mm -hmm. 75 Kiss released Kiss Alive. 77 they released Kiss Alive 2. Okay. Rush, Rush had in a in a twelve year span. Rush had released like uh, three or four live albums. I mean, every second or third Grateful Dead album was a live album. You know, so it's it wasn't really a rare thing for for X to, you know, release live albums uh, so close together. Yeah, yeah. So other acts have done that. You know, but it was interesting though to read reviews at the time that yeah. boy they were like you know why do we need another one so close to to tripping life fantastic and you know this is i mean he really in 93 uh in various publications don't buy it eaten up. yeah exactly oh of course but it was just interesting how he got you know trash for that for in some publications i mean you know why him i i'm you know who knows um but uh but all right let's get to so first impressions so um you know, so back in 93, we all buy the album uh, or thereabouts in 93. So I was really excited when this came out. I remember because, of course, you know, I didn't get to see the tour. And so I was really excited to to hear this. Um, and uh, and I I overall, you know, liked the album, uh, I, I recall it at the time, but um you know, obviously not the same as, as seeing it live, but it gives you an idea, obviously, of, uh, you know, what it was like. Plus, you got to hear the Off the Ground songs live, um, which gives them a different dimension. But I somehow remember I, I wasn't as crazy about it as Tripping Live Fantastic. Now, I think part of it was because I saw those shows, you know, the tripping uh, that were on Tripping the Live Fantastic. So I was probably more emotionally attached to the 89-90 tour. So I have a feeling I was more, you know, I, I just probably had a preference for that album because I saw it. Um, but, uh, but I think I may have changed my views a bit, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit. So first impressions, what, what did you think? So, so Ken, you, you listened to the album, um, back then, you know, what was your first, you know, first impression of it? You know, I hate to say this, I enjoyed it, but when you look at the entire solo catalog of the Beatles, I don't spend that much time listening to live albums all that much. I hate to admit mm -hmm. it. You know, it, it's Wings Over America for me and the concert for Bangladesh. And I love uh, listening to the concert for George. Of course, it's great to, to watch the videos for all that stuff. But I don't listen all that much to, to the other live albums. And I really think I should spend more time doing it. But I remember being, you know, enjoying uh the live cd but not playing it all that much in in listening back in recent years i'm enjoying it a lot more now than i did before mm -hmm. i think when you when you go back to the 89 90 tour it was a more exciting tour for me because it was the first time in 13 years that he played in the united states and i'm very fortunately saw him in 76 and 13 years is an awful long wait yeah. <laughs> to see one of your favorite artists there so just you know i would have been happy to, to hear him do anything in in 1989 but 93 like i said i think it was more of an improvement in the sound of of paul's voice and the band was really hot and um but i didn't spend a lot of time listening to the live album when it first came out it was another live album i'll tell you i listened to unplugged a lot more because it was so different because it was unplugged and it was acoustic and he did a lot of 50 stuff but he did a lot from the first mccartney album that was a little bit more exciting for me because of the the way it was presented it was a different format um 
And at that time, Unplugged was getting to be a very big concept on MTV. But, you know, I enjoyed uh, Paul is Live, but I wasn't blown away by it. I guess it was more a visual thing, you know, for me. It, it's so special to see them in front of your eyes in concert, whether it's on the big screen, look at them, looking at them on the stage. Um, that's so much a big part of it. And, you know, it's actually a very good sounding album, Paul is Live. And, uh, you know, I appreciate it more now than when it first came out. Mm -hmm. But I never said, you know, this is not worth picking up at all. Yeah. To go back to your point, I think when you're of the stature of a Paul McCartney, any legendary artist, every single time you tour, if your set list varies from the previous tour, it's worth putting out. If it's very much the same, and I got to tell you, in the 2000s, there isn't too much difference from yeah. one Paul McCartney tour to the next. You know, there are certain Beatles songs he's going to play no matter what. There's a core number of solo songs that he plays no matter what. There aren't too many changes outside of whatever the new album is at the time. Um, so this one certainly warranted a live album. I'm very happy that he put it out. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, still, I liked it when it came out, but I wasn't blown away by it because yeah. I'm just not as much of a of a person that listens to live albums as much as studio albums. Yeah, yeah, and I agree. And and you make a good point about Unplugged because I, I remember that too. I played Unplugged a lot more, mm. uh, certainly. And it had been years, to be honest, that, you know, since I've listened to, to this. And, right. and, I'm, and I'm glad, I'm glad we did this show because it was great to, to listen to this again. Uh, Joe, what, what were your initial impressions? All right, well, first of all, I'll say that, uh, what you know, I echo a lot of the same feelings on this too, that, as Ken said. But um, when I bought it, yeah, I usually can remember a lot of the solo stuff, where I was, where I got something. I have no re recollection of picking this up, although, of course, I did as soon as it came out. But I don't remember uh, anything about it. I like the cover. I think it's mm -hmm. cool. And I like the title, even though it's simple. I think yeah. it's clever. Paul is live. Sort of Paul is dead. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> and, yeah, so that part I like. And... Um, yeah, like we said before, you know, I thought uh, his, his voice was better in this, so I, I, it's recorded well, for sure. I remember thinking that uh, a lot of the tracks, would, and again, I haven't played this in a while. I didn't play it in preparation for the show. I think I remembered it good enough, though. But I, I guess you have to do this to fit more material. I remember the tracks seemed kind of like t close together, like they go, go into them pretty quick, mm -hmm. you know, not enough room to breathe which uh, if i remember correctly which which is fine um and i i like hearing the uh off the ground songs I, i'm disappointed that the, the title track isn't on here um you know it's, it's one thing i'll say about it or another day um yeah maybe i would say i'm a little disappointed too that um uh, i i you know i don't know I, sound check stuff doesn't thrill me i it just depends on the song Especially if it's going to be part of the live album, maybe. Um, put it if you put it separately. Hey, Paul, how about that sound check package that was rumored a while yeah. ago? Just a, an album of your of your sound checks and one dedicated release. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. But I don't play live albums, as Ken said. I I don't really care. And in some of the titles that he mentioned, like Concert for George, I love that. But I like it with the visuals. You know, I like to watch the concert for Bangladesh. I don't play, ever play the the record. You know, mm -hmm. um, I like to watch. If I'm going to do even rock show, I rather watch. Uh, you know, rather than Wings uh, Over America, I rather watch it and see yeah. it too at the same time. So, so that's really what I do with 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 live albums. An exception is that I love listening to uh, the Amoeba gig. Mm -hmm. uh, which I, I play that a, a lot more, I think, than these others. Um, I do enjoy this, I think, as a listening experience more than a, um, tri uh, Tripping the Life Fantastic, except that Tripping the Life Fantastic has more a lot more on it. Yeah. I'm also partial to, oh, what's the other one? I'm a little, uh, Good Evening, New York. Is that the name of it? New York City? New York City. I, I, I'm more partial to that though over this 
So I'm trying to like give everything, it, you know, its place here where I think this this is is somewhere maybe in the middle for me, I guess. Mm -hmm. To the other ones, be you know, I I, I played it uh, quite a few times. I think when I first got it, and then it's on the shelf a lot. I remember I remember bringing this to a Beetle Fest once for some reason uh, several years ago. I mean, uh, you know, say pre COVID, mm -hmm. this was what I listened to. In the on the ride there, you know, I, I pulled it out, so, but I don't generally love live live albums. I'll always go for studio, studio. studio. live, except to okay. to watch is always great though. Yeah, to see it all. Think. Yeah, I mean, it's I can definitely see that. I mean, it's you know, it's it, it obviously one's a, another dimension to it. I mean, yeah, I'll reach for the yeah. some of the the, the DVDs. And yeah. I don't remember all the titles now, you know, but the, yeah, no, the A and E one and stuff. I I yeah. reach for those more than albums. Absolutely, absolutely. Tom, what's your uh, what was your initial take on it? Now, and well, and this is true with all of you. You of course saw the show, so this you know probably brought back a lot of memories uh, as as you were listening to it. Where to start? Um... <laughs> I, I listen. I I truly believe that this is a miss opportunity of a live album. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is is you you don't close a live album with sound check songs. I I just think that was a terrible idea. Okay, mm -hmm. especially especially when you have another day off the ground every night fixing a hole. Um, you know I, I you know someone said in the comments that he did listen to what the man said. Uh, in New Orleans, um, you know, uh, you know, get out of my way. That was performed at the at the gig that Joe saw. Um, you know, I mean, the missed opportunity. The mm -hmm. other thing is, is that it suffers because of tripping the live fantastic because that was a three LP set, yeah. and then you had banger after banger after banger after banger mm -hmm. Beatles songs on that one, and 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 Paul solo stuff that like what was left over now don't get me wrong there's a lot of stuff really good stuff left over but you know you don't have the heavy hitters on this one like you did on tripping the live fantastic yeah. now i mean i love the fact that my love is on here right i love penny lane on here um the only and the only we should note the only difference between the two is the is the live and let die that's the only one that was on tripping that made it onto to this one, which I have no problem with whatsoever. But, you know, you just don't have, you know, Penny Lane, like I said, paperback writer. Fixing a Hole was in that trio of songs. I just would have loved to heard that whole trio uh, right there, you know. And, and plus the fact is, you know, off the ground of the songs that they played from off the ground is my favorite. So in the personal reasons, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know I wish that one was on there. Um, but I will say... That you know, touring this this being the second go around without Chris Witten and you had the the um, what was the guy's drummer uh, the the new drummer, um, Blair Cunningham. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you know they were tight. This was a tight yeah. sounding band. I mean, I will say that though I don't necessarily care for peace in the neighborhood and looking for changes, they really rocked those songs uh, on on this album and on that tour. Um, you know, so they were a really good tight band at that point in time. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, there's some, you know, the, 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 the cons I think outweigh the pros on this one for me. Um, mm. but, but like Joe said, I mean, it's kind of like in the middle, uh, and like Ken said too, I mean, I don't always go to live stuff. I mean, I'm always just going to listen to, I'm a studio guy. I, you know, I love the yeah. studio albums, you know, people get mad at me because I prefer the studio. Maybe I'm amazed over the live version, you know, but me too. I like them both, but I prefer the studio. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but that's it. I mean, Robbie's bit, I mean, I understand he's the part of the band, you know, and you want to throw him a bone, but this is a Paul McCartney record. It's Paul's live. It's not, it's not Robbie's uh, live. It okay. wasn't that way in wings. Fair enough. You got Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I love. I, 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 I hear you, Ken. I hear you, but not when you still have another day in you know, and all these songs left off. Yes. I mean, yeah. tell me you would not have rather seen those four songs that I instead of Robbie Spit on this album. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I had my way, as much as I like the soundcheck material, right. I think 
pretty cool. I never heard of Hotel in Benidorm before. <laughs> it's nice to hear it, even though it's, you know, a, a quick little thing that he put together. Um, I'd much rather off the ground is in there and and uh, get out of my way and a few of the Beatles songs, whatever you can fit in there. But right. I think that they very consciously made sure that they didn't want to duplicate the same songs that right. were in the 990 tour. So the only song that is duplicated is Live and Let Die. Right. So maybe they didn't want to have another double CD or triple album with so many of the same songs from the previous tour. So that's yeah. why they whittled it down to this. Right. Yeah. No, and that's fine. And mm -hmm. that's fine. But again, you still have four great tracks that weren't on the album. Wasn't mm -hmm. this a Fixing a Hole's debut of him? Or I anybody believe it was. Doing yeah. it? I don't think Maybe. he did Fixing yeah, a Hole before this. Yeah, I don't know if he did that on the 89. Well, I mean, I mean, he did it at, when I saw, I mean, I saw him at the, get the titles right, the, the MTV right. Up Close. Yes, he did it there. Yeah. But I mean, but I mean, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was ninety-two, December ninety-two. Well, yeah. yeah. So. Well, since we're we're kind of veering into this territory, let's let's get into what we did and did not like uh, about about the album. So oh. let's uh, so let's get into what what were the positives? What were some moments that uh, that you did like about the album? So uh, so Tom, let's let's start with you since you were. Going a little bit of what what you didn't like, what did you like about? You? Well, I tell you, as someone that's really starting to appreciate Hope of Deliverance these days, mm -hmm. uh, I love love that bit. And um, and Biker like an icon. Listen, I mean that's as deep as a cut as you can go on an album, you know. Yeah. And the fact that he he played that on this tour, I thought was 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 great. Um, you know the 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 paperback writer Penny Lane, uh, you know combo right there. Um, was great, uh, and my love uh, was good too. But to be honest with you, other than that, you know, I'm look. I mean, Magical Mystery Tour is is fun live, uh, you know. But uh, just to you know, you know, to hear it on a live album rather than seeing it, it's a whole different, you know, wow. uh, whole different thing. Like 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 Joe and Ken had, had, had mentioned. But you know, other than that, this is for me is is kind of a little uninspiring. Mm. Of, of, a, of a song listing of for a live album um you know maybe mm -hmm. i'm taking it too seriously i don't know but, uh, <laughs> oh. that's an in, in joke in joke <laughs> in joke oh man ken what what were some highlights for you um definitely the off the ground material i mm -hmm. think peace in the neighborhood sounds so good they rock it they rock it I know a lot of people put that song down. It was the bathroom break song and all that, but I loved it. And I think the band just sounded so good. It almost has like a little bit of a jazz feel to it. Almost Steely Danish, that song. Um, and Paul's vocals were fantastic on there. Um, Come on, People sounds great. Hope of Deliverance, like you said, Tom. Um, yeah. The Beatles songs are nice to have, finally. Live recordings of all these songs. Penny Lane sounds good. Um... Well, Lady Madonna, at least you had on Wings Over America, but right, that was right. a very spirited, energetic version of Lady Madonna. Um, I like the fact that My Love was on there, mm. although it was also on Wings Over America. We're not really concerned about songs that were on Wings Over America being duplicated, but the ones on Shipping the Life, fantastic. It was nice to have Here, There, and Everywhere, although he did that in Unplugged. Um, Michelle yeah. on tour is really nice. Um, all my loving for the first time live on a tour is nice. Um, I liked all of it, really, for the most part. I don't really have many complaints about about the CD or the album, other than what we just said. And and I mentioned the off the ground material. I I would have preferred off the ground on here and get out of my way, but to not have another day on this list is criminal yeah. <laughs> it yeah. really is it, it was performed so well you know one of the one of the sad things about paul i hate to say this is that like there's a time when he was on saturday night live and he didn't sound good on saturday night live yeah. the 93 tour they the last show i think it was in north carolina they broadcast that on television yeah. it was the end of the tour his voice was tired. He didn't sound his best. So the general public who don't really follow Paul that closely, 
they're not getting a great impression of him <laughs> right. live, you know. But what you need to do is, you know, listen to an album like this. I mean, he's still a terrific performer no matter what, and I still think he has one of the greatest voices no matter what. Um, but this one really sounds good all the way throughout. Um, it was also a cool thing at the time he was doing I Want to Be Your Man, which he has as a sound check here. It's cute. You know, I like to have that because I haven't had it before. But still, I'd rather have the songs that were left off. Mm -hmm. um, I made up a whole list here of songs that were not included. But then well, some let's let's the get to that because we're going to get to the weaker parts. Yeah. So, <laughs> so hang on to that. All right. <laughs> yeah. Hang on to those. Okay. We're, we're, we're going to get to that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, Cause yeah, I want to know what you guys thought of then Tom's already shared some, but, but we'll, we'll get to it of what you, you know, what you thought were kind of the weaknesses mm -hmm. uh, of, of the album. So, so hang on to those. Um, just uh, uh, before we get to Joe, just to chime in, cause some of what you said I, about the strengths, I completely agree. Yeah. That piece in the neighborhood version was fantastic. I, I agree. Great guitar solos in that, you know, that, that, uh, and I've always kind of, like that song i know a lot of people you know put it down and and yes it's i'm not saying it's one of his all-time best and one of his all-time best looks but i mean it's a it's a positive song i've always kind of liked it and this this live version i really enjoyed i i thought that yeah the band just nailed it yeah. um you know really like that michelle as you mentioned boy paul's voice sounded terrific on that mm. i mean he was just a great great voice um i had forgotten that you know he that paul started some shows with drive my car and i agree joe that it not quite as you know like probably hello goodbye magical mystery tour were the best uh openings but i thought it was kind of fun that he started with, with well drive it does my open car. up rubber soul yeah right you know but uh but i still enjoyed it that that you know, it's one of my favorite Beatles songs so um and again great job um and uh paperback writer i liked his version on here and again it's one of my favorites so uh so really enjoyed it also love the covers uh that he did on this tour of you know kansas city good rock in the night i wish uh, uh paul would bring back some of that on on his tours i loved his you know, bring back some of the songs that we all know. You know I, I'm not paying five hundred dollars to see him do covers, Queen. Sorry. Well, not I'm not saying you know, bring, like play ten of them or anything, but just a couple, just a couple. You know, because they it shows the influences, and I I really enjoyed those. So uh, those were some highlights for me. Um, but uh, so yeah, and um, you know, and and the sound overall, I thought particularly the Boulder recordings were really sharp. I, I mm. thought those particular were, were excellent. Uh, Joe, how about you? What were some there, highlights? There's nothing I can say that's fresh. There's nothing I can say that's all the same. <laughs> um, but basically, first and foremost, for me, for you know, being a diehard solo fan, um, I like to hear the stuff from off the ground. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite stuff on here. Um, I, I wish, well, we talked about that before, that off the ground had been on and, and, and et cetera. I like the way he does all of them. I think "Piece of the Neighborhood" is underrated. I just I, I like it more than it, 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 its reputation is. Uh, I might like it more than "People Want Peace." I don't know if we can compare it to of them, but um, I think it, it it works live. A lot of times when I've heard him do it live, I, I, I kind of like it, you know. And uh, I think "Biker Like an Icon" gets a hard knocks because of its the title is kind of maybe a little bit silly sounds funny or something but i love the way he paul when he really is into it and really starts rocking out on it as he gets more and more in, into the song later yeah. and he really tries to reach different heights with it i love that about it um come on people is one of my favorites a lot of people diss that song hey everybody's got an opinion um so I, some people call it a hey jude for the nineties. I know that's pushing it, but I but I, I you know what they mean. I love Come On People. I, I, I've always liked that song. Um as far as the uh Beatles songs go, at least you got some different stuff here. Uh, Ken said I was gonna bring up I think it's all my loving for the first time mm -hmm. Paul uh do, doing that. And um yeah, no, I didn't. I'm not. Met, well, nobody mentioned here, there, and everywhere. I guess it's like that's a little old hat for this, uh, in my opinion, as as is Lady Madonna. But I well, like him doing paperback writer. I, okay, you know, 
So sorry to Joe, not to interrupt, but you know, I when I while listening to that, I completely forgot to to listen if he did the did the uh, Broad Street version or if he did the the original version. Love of my own. Love of my own. I completely forgot to look and see if he did that or not on the yeah, on this version. I oh. thought he did the original, but yeah, it's the original. Yeah, okay. yeah. it's closer to the unplugged version. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, paperback writer. Penny Lane, of course, uh, yeah, yeah, it, you know, again, we're talking later about what should have been on here and what we didn't like. Uh, is that is that it, Kit? Later on. Okay, so yeah, we'll get to now what what yeah. we didn't like. So, uh, Ken, I know you were you were dying to mention what what uh, songs were left off and that kind of thing. So we'll we'll get to you first. So what what did you think you know was lacking or weaknesses or what what uh, what do you think? As a live album, the only weaknesses for me are the songs that are not in there that should be in there. The actual sound quality, the actual performance. And I also think that it's kind of ironic how so many of McCartney's songs translate better live. Mm -hmm. yeah. We would talk about that quite often with the Wings Over America material. Some people prefer a lot of that stuff from Band on the Run and Venus and Mars and Speed of Sound as live recordings. Some people, well, not maybe not Joe, <laughs> but uh, I think the off the ground material works really well live. And yeah, I forgot to mention Michael like an icon. The band really cooks on that. So in terms of the actual performance, I've really got no complaints at all about any of it. Um, no, it has to do more with what should have been on there. And I wrote down all the songs from the tour that he did that didn't make this list. And the ones that didn't make it, other than the ones that we really want on there, were on the previous. So you have Coming Up, which was which is not on here. Get Out of My Way, which really should have been on here. Another Day, which should have been on here. Off the Ground should have been on here. Can't Buy Me Love, yep. which was on Tripping. Every Night, which was on Unplugged. Unplugged, yeah. Yeah. And I Love Her, which was also on Unplugged. Much slower version, though um yesterday uh let it be the long winding road fixing a hole he did sergeant pepper ben on the run i saw her standing there hey jude and for two shows only mullah kintyre um so it's really only the songs that are not included in here that i'm upset about but then if you included all those songs and they fit on more than one cd you'd have to make it two cds and then you'd have to duplicate all the other songs but as much as I like having the sound check stuff, you don't really have to have it. Uh, if it if it means getting rid of Robbie's bit, I'm willing to part with that. <laughs> Certainly to have another day in there or any of the off the ground material. That's really the only complaint that I have to make about it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it is a 77 minute uh, runtime on there. So you're not given that much more time for anything else. Yeah, and they do tighten it up, like I said before. They do tighten right. everything up there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Fair. Fair enough. Joe, what you were you were starting to say? Your your, you know, what you didn't like as much. Well, so, but... it's the same thing, you know. As I heard Ken going through the list, though, I thought, like, I, you know, I I I can understand. You know, besides time reasons, not putting Hey Jude, Long and Winding Road, all the usual ones, because those were already on. You know, you had those already. If you want to try something totally uh, to make it a little more fresh and not make it the same record as the last time, maybe that's why you leave some of those off. But um, fixing a hole is really like, again, uh, it sounds like <laughs> they keep saying the same thing, but fixing a hole really needs to be on here. That out of all the Beatles songs, I think. Uh, because because it would be like uh, something something new for, mm -hmm. for for Paul to have on a live album, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what else? And then uh, yeah, I would easily give up Robbie's bit. Sorry, Robbie. You know, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, all the sound check material to get all the songs we've been talking about on there, like you know, that we listed. You know, another day and uh, some other you know the other tracks that I mentioned. Um, other than that, you know, nothing wrong with any of the performances, you know. Uh, like Ken was saying that too, we agree on that. Just the stuff that's missing, and I don't think uh, out of the stuff that Ken mentioned, like I said, I don't think you had to have every little thing on this one because then you just get it's getting too much like the last one. Yeah. 
you know. Right. But they had enough material to, to pick from that would make it different. And even and I love her as much, you know. Uh, but they didn't use that. Like you said, it was on unplugged, but it was a slower, a different kind of arrangement, mm -hmm. though. More soulful. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Love that version. Yeah. You know, you know. Um, I, yeah, I, and I love Unplugged too. And by the way, you know, I, there's never been, as far as I know, an official like like video release of that. That I, you know, it's it's. I'd like to see that Sunday in its entirety. Oh yeah, yeah and it, we have we can work it out on here. I don't know if we talk much about that. Yeah, because no. that's on that's on Unplugged as well. Yeah, it is. And and what's fun about that is that you know he makes a mistake. He forgets the words uh, Unplugged. You know. Yeah. And. Uh, the actual raw version has him starting it over more than what you hear on the actual release of it. He does, he, he, he forgets it a couple of times, not just the once, which is which is fun. But yeah, so that's it. You know, not not much to grouse about except the missing songs that the ones that we feel personally should be there. Uh, Tom, you you've already shared um, you know some of of your issues with it, but are there other things well, that you want to talk about well i mean just the, the whole sound check thing just kind of still kind of irks me i mean because there was some sound check stuff on the tripping live fantastic as well so he had already done that idea um mm -hmm. you know and to, to carry it over to, uh, to this one yeah you know maybe not the best idea but again um I mean, just the fact that, you know, Tripping the Live was so, you know, so huge, you know, and with the, you know, with the, you know, with the some more of the well-known stuff, you know, with the bands on the runs, the Hey Judes and and all that, the Maybe I'm Amazed, you know, it kind of just, you know, you're, you're just leaving the, the scraps, you know, in a way, kind of. For this one, not to no listen, not that not that here, there, and everywhere, and paperback writer and Penny Lane are 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 bad. What I'm saying is is just the, that the, you know the 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 material that he's promoting, you know, I, I think is inferior to the stuff he was promoting um, three years earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's just I'm not, my a big, not a big fan of flowers in the dirt. Now, now I know Ken's going to get a big more. <laughs> reactions no well i mean it, it, for me yeah i think the sound check material if it had been you know if he like in the you know the last tour um he did you know um when i saw him a couple of years ago and he was doing songs in the sound check like women and wives you know if it had been songs like that um you know back then like other album songs that he wasn't performing in the concert if he had been doing that kind of stuff in soundcheck that would have been good but these were just kind of aimless jams that he was doing right and so i mean like the a fine day i mean that went on way too long and yeah and I just didn't find it very interesting. Sorry, guys. Yeah. I, I'm well, sure there's some defenders of it out there, yeah. but I just didn't find it very interesting. Yeah. And I don't want to make it sound like I'm pooping on the on the, the tour and the show itself no. because I had an absolute blast with that mm -hmm. show that I saw. All I'm just saying is that this that this album just doesn't duplicate that excitement that I had for the show. Yeah. No, no, I understood. And and I think. Yeah, I mean the you know I know you've all said it already. You know the Robbie's bit. I mean I love Robbie McIntosh. You know <laughs> incredible guitarist. Uh, but yeah, I don't think we really needed that. I don't think we needed the other because as I said, these soundtracks were just kind of aimless jams. If he had done you know a, another um, you know off the ground track or or some other album track that he wasn't going to be doing live, that would have been interesting. Now. So what? <laughs> some other song now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind the sound check material at all as long right. as you have the space to fill for it. Exactly. You know, with Tripping the Live Fantastic, you got all the songs from the tour. Plus right. you threw in the sound check material. You can yeah. put in the sound check material if you want to, as long as you've gotten all the songs. But right. in this case, the, like I said, there was an attempt not to duplicate. Yeah. Right. And I and, and I get that. I mean, and I understand that, but yeah, I would I would have rather had another day than a fine day. Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I wouldn't have rather had another day than a fine. I I, mean, I want another day. I don't want. Let me, let me saying, start Queen, over. Another, I want a, another day, not a fine day. There we go. I said it. Uh, but yes, I mean, I you know, I don't want aimless jams. I want 
you know, or, or if you're going to have soundtrack stuff, I want real songs, you know, but yeah. you know, um, Kiss, Kiss did a really cool thing when they did their second live album in 77. They didn't want to they didn't want to duplicate any songs that they had on their first um, live album. So what they did was they had the first three sides were were all live songs from the tour. That fourth side ended up being all new material. So that way they didn't end up duplicating any of the live stuff, which, you know, I thought was kind of cool. But, you know, I guess Sazich Calzone, when it comes to those things. <laughs> it's my line. I see what you did. Now, uh, so how would we, We kind of, one of you mentioned this earlier. So, yeah, let's get to it. So let's stack this up between this and Tripping the Live Fantastic. How would you compare the two? Does anybody... That's tough. Yeah, I mean, just just the song. I mean, listen. I think the band, it, it, the band is great. I think throughout both of them, I think I think they're they're tight. Um, they sound great. Uh, the backing, especially backing vocals, I think is it, it's really good. Uh, you know, maybe not. You know, Linda on Hey Jude. I mean, <laughs> oh dear. Uh, yeah, yeah. But we won't. That's a different show, that's right there. That's a whole different Anyways, show. Yeah, but but I mean, again, I mean say what you will about his voice on tripping life fantastic i mean you i think we all can agree that it, i think maybe it's the better track listing of the two well yeah that's the thing i don't know that's, i was thinking about that myself um, that's why i'm running it through in my head there's so much good stuff there in beatles wise too but you know i, I as i say i like some of the songs of flowers in the dirt i'm not i was you know wild about about his others so it's it's weird like the Beatles stuff. There's a lot of good stuff. Fool on the Hill. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff to to pick from there. And then, and although I'm not th thrilled with all of Flowers in the Dirt, but some of it, there's that to weigh. Yeah, this is really, it's interesting question. Interesting question. Which do I prefer? His voice is better on Paul is Live, I think. So there's that. You know, so you know what? There's something to recommend in both. Yeah, because yeah, because okay, yeah, good for, point. Good yeah. point. Yeah. Because yeah, with with tripping the life fantastic, you get more bang for the buck, for sure. Right. Uh, because you get a lot more songs. Um, but yeah, maybe he's a little bit in better voice. Falls live. You get more. Somebody pointed out in the comments that tripping the life fantastic, you get a bit more wings. Because I think on uh, on Paul's live, there isn't as much wings there. Uh, no. So it's like, ugh, this is kind of a better cover here. You get a better cover with Paul's <laughs> live. Um, I'm trying to remember. It has um, "Tripping Life Fantastic" been remastered? Yeah, right. There's the cover. No, uh, I mean, I I don't think it has. I think this is the only release it's gotten. Yeah, because it it could use nice, a remastering. I, mm. I, I think it could uh, use that because in 19 in 2019 when he released that live uh, set of LPs, it was "Paul is Live." It was uh, the Russian album. It was Amoeba, mm -hmm. and uh, it was "Wings Over America." Okay, so so it hasn't obviously. Yeah, so okay, it totally skipped it could, over tripping. Yeah, it could use a remastering, I think. Um, yep, Kim, what it, what's your take? Well, you know, since "Flowers in the Dirt" is my favorite McCartney album. <laughs> yep. Um, plus the fact that in eighty nine ninety he broke out so many Beatles songs that he never did live before. Um. I would go with Trippin' the Live Fantastic, but like we said, Paul was in better voice and Paul is live. But there's so many highlights on Trippin' the Live Fantastic as well. Like yeah. like you said, Joe, Fool on the Hill. What an incredible performance of Fool on the Hill in there. Um, but like I said about the off the ground material, I think the flowers and the dirt material worked really well live. You know, My Brave Face, We Got Married was tremendous yeah. live. I love Figure of Eight. Figure of eight, yeah, <laughs> you know, which, he, which is a track that everybody loves the live version over the studio version, yeah. not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I liked it live too, I just didn't mm -hmm. like it opening with that song. I don't, mm -hmm. I didn't like it as an opener. Oh, okay, I wish he would open his concerts with solo, not always with Beatles, which mm -hmm. is for wait. He he brought back Venus and Mars Rock Show several yeah. years, ago. true. That's yeah. a great opener. Yeah. And while I, I love we got we got married now, yeah. I didn't like it then. And that was I hate to say the bathroom track. 
Yeah. I can't stand with that because you know when people you know you know people don't want to listen to the new stuff. A lot of times, a lot of the people are there. It's like, oh, you know, this is time to go to the restroom. You know, which is sad. You know, when you do that. But uh, you know, this one was great. Oh, I love that. Oh yeah. You know, put it there. It was nice to there. have. Yep. Those yeah. two I like. <laughs> All in terms of the material, I would go with Tripping the Lie. Fantastic. Um, I don't know. Let's just say we never had Tripping the Lie. Fantastic. And Paul is Live was a double album of the whole tour. Oh. Of everything that he did there. So there would be the repeat stuff of what he would have done in 8990. Would you have preferred that over Tripping the Lie? Fantastic? Considering his voice was better? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. It's a I don't tough think one. The live because I, I like flowers in the dirt yeah. as an album. I, I, yeah, yeah, I like tripping out. What I was would, would would have maybe preferred, you know, as you know, all things, you know, we know we know hindsight's twenty twenty, you know, we, we know what happened with Linda, but I would have preferred, you know, do the do off the ground, then you know, then another album, you know, flower. I mean, a flaming pie, and then you have two albums to support rather than just the one. Um, and then I think which makes you know more of an interesting album. But we know how you know how history has turned out. So, you know, unfortunately, he wasn't able to do that. But you know, just to, to support, you know, but but that's what you do. That's what artists do, right? They put out an album and then they go on tour. You know, so. By the way, Christian, I did not use the restroom. I, I don't use restrooms at concerts. <laughs> Just so you know, I was I, I stayed in my seat. I did not leave. I'm talking about most people you could see leaving we, during We Got Married. But do you do a beer run? <laughs> no, I'm not much of a... No. <laughs> Just kidding. No. That's what the other thing people do. Beer runs. Beer runs. That's, what, that's the thing about Paul's shows for me. And I, I think for you guys as well is that once it starts, I mean, you are just sucked in. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's no, I don't going, move. Anywhere. There's no going anywhere for me. No, anyway. I don't, I don't understand. That. Unless, you, unless it's an emergency. Okay. No, no, but, no. For, but for the most part, I'm like, well, same thing with movies. I don't understand. You know, you're at a concert to, to watch the show. You're at a movie to watch the movie. You know, you don't get, I'm going to go now and go over to the concession stand or something. Mm -hmm. I don't get that. Yep. That's a whole different show. Concert etiquette. <laughs> do oh, yeah. Don't stand do up. But they, but they will. Don't stand up. Don't <laughs> sing. You know? <laughs> <Don't care. laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, uh, so, oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Ken. What? You know, I've been to a lot of McCartney shows, but to me, the Boston crowd's always been the best. Really? really? I see very few of them get up out of their chairs and leave during any song. Mm. You know? Wow. Mm. Maybe the food's not good in Boston. I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the bathrooms are. Well, the beer's good there because that's where Sam Adams comes from, and that's my favorite beer. So there you oh. go. Well, there sh that shoots that theory down. <laughs> so, so let's get back to just a couple of uh, more questions to close out the discussion. So, um, we talked about earlier about the. Um, you know, some of the flack that, that Paul got uh, from releasing this album so close to the other live albums. So here's a, an example of a review that came out, you know, criticizing him uh, at the time. This is from All Music. Um, uh, Stephen Thomas Erwine, one of their, you know, more well-known reviewers. So Paul McCartney's fourth live album in, in four years, including Tripping the Live Fantastic, the highlights, and we mentioned that earlier, is arguably his weakest yet, full of competent but utterly unnecessary versions of Beatles classics and recent McCartney numbers. Really, does anyone need to hear a live version of Biker Like an Icon? And after putting out two separate live albums from his previous tour, it, it smacks of overkill to release this record, which has the exact same band and tone as Tripping the Live Fantastic, which of course is not true. It's a different drummer, but, mm. uh, but other than that. So, uh, what is your okay, Joe? What is no, I, no, I don't count that? highlights. First of all, <laughs> I that, that, is that he's counting highlights in there? Yes, yeah. he's counting yeah. highlights. No, I yeah. don't count that. I don't count mm -hmm. that. You know, yeah. but anyway, which that's did so table. well, which <laughs> did so well. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. well, it's really. he's talking about tripping the life, fantastic, more or less, and he's talking about unplugged. I guess I he think. is. Yeah, yeah totally, yeah. totally different thing. You know, mm -hmm. totally different thing. 
It's an intimate, you know, MTV setting, intimate little audience. You know, it's a totally different thing. And all the versions are different, you know. I mean, that's not, you know, a big venue, stadium show, rock show. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, yeah, I, yeah I, I would, needless to say, I don't agree with them. And, of course, the thing about Biker Like an Icon, like any other critic's review, is subjective. Yeah. You know? So, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Now, actually, this was not the biggest uh, seller. Uh, it said it, uh, this became uh, the lowest selling live set of his career, peaking at number 34 in the UK and number yeah. 78 in the US. Mm. So this was not uh, as big a seller as uh, some of the others. And, and uh, you know, partially that was said that, you know, because it came out too soon after Tripping Alive unplugged all that. So, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. So what year did that did it actually come out? Ninety. Uh, Ninety three. Uh, no, tri no, no, oh, no. oh, 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 yeah. tripping alive. Um, was right. it ninety one? Or was it ninety? Or was it ninety? <laughs> Let me double check. So it was the eighty nine ninety tour, right? Yeah. Okay. Talk amongst yourselves. I'd like to know. <laughs> Let me double check. Okay, so he's on ninety. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Ninety. Yeah, okay. right. Three years. I mean, come on. Yeah. Unless it's the kind of unplugged. Ninety, ninety-one. Mm -hmm. Unless I, I don't know what year did that. Well, January ninety-one was the actual show of unplugged. I don't yeah. know exactly when the. It was released in May of ninety-one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. It wouldn't bother me in the least if Paul released a live album every two years. Oh, yeah. The set list varied a lot. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't I mean, like think they need to have 10 live versions of Hey Jude, you yeah. know, or 10 band on the runs <laughs> in my in, in my uh, collection here. But to have the songs that he adds that he's never done live before or hasn't done live for a long time, that for me is what makes it special more than mm -hmm. At this point, just the fact that it's Paul McCartney doing anything is special, you know. Mm -hmm. But for me, as someone who cherishes his whole catalog, I would like to see him go gangbusters on his newest album. But I also would like to see a, a widespread throughout all the different decades. He talked about the uh, 89, 90 tour. Well, there was nothing from the previous album from Press to Play on there. And the only thing out of the 80s was was coming in yeah, Ivory. Ebony and mm -hmm. Ivory, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I forgot. Which told you how much he thought of that decade. Yeah. And he dropped that song early. Yeah. Yep, that's true. Um, So we've talked about the, you know, pros and cons of the album. Talked about, you know, it's not an album that we all revisit that much. But there were some, there are some positives to it in terms of the performances, the fact that he does perform some songs off off the ground, which you know you can't really get anywhere else. So mm -hmm. overall, uh, would you recommend this album? You know, if you were speaking to an average Paul fan, maybe not a like a you know really diehard fan, would you recommend Paul is Live? To them or would you say that this is only for hardcore fans you know yes. would you say that this is <laughs> would you say that this is something that the average paul fan should have or do you think that this is you know something that you know they could skip and that only a hardcore fan should own so tom we'll start with you i'd recommend every paul album to a casual fan myself but uh I mean, I would tell them eventually, yeah. I mean, I would say we'll start with maybe start with Wings Over America. If you like that, then go to Tripping. And then if you like that, go to, you know, the next one. But yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I wouldn't talk it down because mm -hmm. just because maybe I might good. not talk <laughs> glowingly, might, maybe because I might not talk glowingly about it, that doesn't mean somebody else has, you know, the opposite feelings about it. That's why I tend to stay on the more positive side because mm -hmm. who am I to tell the, the poo poo on something that somebody might love, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, that's, that's my feelings towards it. Mm -hmm. well, almost anything then you would just say, Try it. You know, well, you're right that anybody else could have a different opinion. Yeah, but so, you wouldn't say like start with this. 
you would I wouldn't say. say necessarily start with it, but yeah. I mean, it's so much easier now, though, to to listen to this album. I mean, all you got to do now is just go to YouTube and you can probably, right. you know, hear the hear the whole thing. And then you can decide there if you want to buy it, you know, or mm-hmm. so you know. There, there's 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 that. So. Yep. Mm-hmm. Ken, what do you think? Well, you know, every live album from Paul appeals to both a hardcore and a casual fan because they all have hits on them you know you take paul's live for example there's a lot of beatles songs on there and if you know the beatles catalog you're going to welcome all those songs there's a few solo hits that you should know on there um live and let dies on here um i would hope everybody knows the band on the run album so let me roll it shouldn't be unfamiliar but i wouldn't expect the average fan out there to know off the ground average person Mm-hmm. what's that the average person uh, first yes you caught me just <laughs> i throw these things in there <laughs> um but i mean if if you if you're not someone that's followed everything mccartney's done even wings over america has you know venus and mars material and speed of sound material that you may not know so um it's tough to say. I mean, in terms of CDs, this is only one disc, so it costs less than the others mm-hmm. uh, before that. But I think overall, as a package, Wings Over America and Tripping the Live Fantastic better serve Paul because although I prefer Wings Over America because I wish there wasn't so much Beatles. I love the Beatles, but I think he relies too much on Beatles. And he's been right. that way since 8990. Right. Um, but for all the people that love the Beatles stuff, as I do, um, you know, 8990, the Trip in the Life Fantastic set is fine. But in terms of actual, you know, quality of voice, I would go more with Wings Over America and Paul is Live. But they're all good, you know? <laughs> it's really tough to decide. It's not like Paul does just the greatest hit show that right. the casual fan does. He always puts in stuff. He tries to throw in something like a temporary secretary <laughs> to, to appeal to the more hardcore fan. Mm-hmm. I want to hear more temporary secretaries. Okay, I don't so need to hear, right. let me roll it for the zillion time. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. That's just me. So everyone's different. Yeah. Okay. Joe? I'll keep it very simple. If you're a uh, diehard or somewhat heavy McCartney fan, you got to have it. If you're a casual fan, it's easily skipped. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And I kind of, I guess I would say I, I kind of go along with, with Joe on this one that, yeah, hardcore fan, you have to have this because this is where you're going to find off the ground live stuff. I mean, this is the only place you can get it. Um, and, uh, but the average fan, I kind of say a bit like, like Tom that, you know, if you're first learning about Paul, then yeah, I, I'd say, uh, you know, Wings Over America and Chirping Live, fantastic. Also, what Ken said, but um, yeah, Paul is Live would be kind of further down the road, you know. Uh, but uh, but yeah, but for hardcore fans, yeah, you definitely have to have this because again, only place you're going to find off the ground stuff live, and uh, and it also reminds you what a great band the '89 to '93. Uh, touring them was they really were they were just tight and so professional you yeah. know I, I miss this band I really do I mean not that the band he tours with now and for the well the past 20 odd years hasn't been fantastic but this was a special band Live, would, fantastic yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> well I, I'm do we do Really good drummers. I love Robbie as a guitar yep. player. And Ham and Hamish Stewart. Oh my God. Do you do you guys see one more tour, two more tours? Do you guys I mean I know we hope so, but I mean in reality, do you guys think we're gonna get another tour? I actually I actually yes. don't hope so. And I don't mean I don't mean again, I'm being honest, you know, because I just think I, I think at this point Paul's reached that point where uh, you know, you know, it's been hit and miss with his voice all along. We know this. Yeah. Sometimes I see him and I'm like, I can't believe this guy. He still can do it. It's yeah. amazing. 
Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he, I, I, he can do it every time. He can do it again and again. Mm-hmm. I, that's amazing. And other times I'm like, ooh, that was rough. I mean, I yeah. hear, listen to him and I'm like, oh, boy. I don't know. Like, I think, what was it, Rio? Where did I hear him recently? And I was... I, I was Brazil. Brazil. The, the yeah, recent I one, I was like, oh, I don't back, know. Back I just would Brazil. like to, to see him. For me, it, it's up to him. It's up to him. <laughs> Paul. But for me as a fan, I would rather see him really try to save his voice best he could to do more studio stuff mm-hmm. with, with the time he has left, you know, mm-hmm. for me. Yeah, I'm well, wondering like see more studio albums. Yeah. yeah. Than live tours. But as long as he's healthy and can do it and he loves being in front of a crowd and pleasing people, I think he's going to continue to tour, but I think he'll do less and less dates each year. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if he would do like a, a farewell tour or something. I don't know if he would just walk off and that. Uh, I, don't I don't know. know. You know, you do you know? Do you realize how much those tickets would be scalped for? Yeah, true. Yeah, that'd be. <laughs> I don't think he'd ever have it in him to I say think, farewell. I, you know, really? I, I think his ego. I don't think he would say farewell. Yeah, I think he knows that too. I mean, that would. I mean, those tickets would would go for mega bucks. Yeah, he that's a good a point. Power tour. Yeah, you know. well, yeah they, so maybe he wouldn't announce it. You're right. Maybe that's true. Yep, hadn't thought of that. So, mm-hmm. well, hopefully we'll get some kind of news soon. And, and we'll, well, see, we'll that's the thing, through. though. But, I mean, if he was to tour, because, I mean, ELO just, you know, Jeff Lynn just announced that last tour. Last tour. Um, and that those are what for September and October, you right? So if, he, if Paul was going to tour, I mean, I would feel like an announcement would have already been made by now mm, yeah that's true so if if something's happening i don't think it's this year mm. yeah you're right i think something no, would have been he announced just, he just did his tour of australia and south right. america and i think he's going to keep doing it he's not going to go for a real long stretch right i mean he had to do it because of covid yeah you know but no i i definitely think he's going to tour this year I just don't think there are going to be as many dates as we'd like. No. But, you know, I'm more uh-huh. concerned. About, I still want more studio albums, as many as we can get. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Agreed. You got to wait like four years now or five years in between studio albums for him. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, somebody, of uh, uh, Lachuver, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, said, saw him at Wrigley Field in 2011. So did I. I was at that concert, too. That's a, that was a great. Well, there were a couple of shows actually, so I'm not sure which one uh, where where you are. All I, uh, it was a great show, but I also remember it was hotter than hell at that <laughs> show. It was like said, like yeah. the two days that summer in Chicago where it was like almost a hundred degrees. I, I remember that we were just dying. But boy, he played the whole show. I don't think he took a sip of water. I mean, yeah, it's always the big thing with Paul, right? People I know, but think- even that day, and I mean, I'm telling you, it was hot. It was one of those days where there a breeze would come along and it would just blow more hot air at you. <laughs> it was like one of those. Oh man, that was that was a great show, though. Fantastic. So, um, so anyway, okay. Closing. Uh, you have any more uh, closing thoughts uh, about uh, Paul is live? Any other thoughts? That, uh... I like what Joe said. He made a, a nice short comment. You do keep them short. So I... <laughs> Go ahead to say. That's for you, Gary Wilbur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to see. Wait a minute. What's the book? I don't care. Well, I haven't seen the book in a long time, but I was... mm-hmm. can't get it out. All right. All right. Well, this was really fun revisiting Paul is live. Um, really glad we got to do it because, as I said, hadn't listened to it in years and. It was fun to revisit those the memories of that that terrific band. And Paul, I'm I'm slowly forgiving you for skipping Chicago on, <laughs> on that tour. I'm I'm just about to forgive you, but that's okay. So uh, why don't we're going to tell everybody what we're up to? And uh, and thank you by the way, all of you for your comments. I've been looking at them as best I I can. We will of course respond to them. Um, We love your comments. Thank you so much for weighing in on your opinions. Um, Of course, uh, you can find us right here on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Um, And uh, of course, uh, if you do that, you will be notified of future episodes. You can also reach us via email at talkmoresolotalk at gmail.com. 
Uh, give us your feedback. Let us know if you have ideas uh, for future topics, uh, for future episodes. You can also find us on Facebook. If you like our page, you will be notified uh, also of future episodes. And we post stuff uh, there uh, so you know what we're up to, any news, that kind of thing. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at TalkMoreTalk1, the number one. And you can also find us on the web at TalkMoreTalk.com. Uh, so let's see. Let's start with Joe. Joe, what, what are you up to on your channel? Okay. On my main channel, which is me, Mr. Mayo, uh, I just did another record store reality video. Some of you like those, uh, that, you know, hanging out at the store with the cast of characters. I just put a new one of those up. Also, I put up a new vinyl finds of all kinds. So even though I'm kind of starting to purge vinyl a lot, I am. I'm starting to buy, I'm buying a little bit here and there, but they, they're few and far between now buying new stuff. You know, uh, on Sunday, March 24th, there's going to be the return of Fab Gab. Okay. Uh, and it's going to be a show where we rank our uh, favorite, or I'll say least to most favorite, John Lennon songs off walls and bridges. And Kid is going to be on there, you know, so far. And I do have a special guest who I will leave till later, that's going to be joining us as well. That's going to be live, and you can do audience participation. You can join us and put your songs in order, you know, and, and we get to take it's each song one by one, like each, you know, position, number whatever it is, 14, 13, whatever, however many are on there, and so on. And, uh, you know, you can uh, give us your numbers. It's very hard to do. Sure I mean, when you, love, you know, when you love an album, it's really hard oh, to, man. to rank them. Uh, but that'll, again, that'll be Sunday, March 24th, uh, probably around 2 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm. Um, look, look out for that. Then on my movie channel, which I call Mayo's Movie Mayhem, which is this also week. about <laughs> this, this week's, week. uh, this week's <laughs> title, because I change it every week. Mayo's Movie Mayhem. Uh, I got, I got a couple of new movie reviews on there and, uh, I did a uh, video on some Marvel comics because it's all it's you know it's movies but it's television it's comics it's things like that you know to do with uh, pop culture and stuff and finally I do uh, the Mayo Lounge live which is anything can happen on there I have uh, guests on there on a regular basis over at the movie channel Mayo's Movie Mayhem thank you. Thank you, Joe. Looking forward to Sunday. That's going to be a blast. I got to get working on my list. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably do it like an hour before or so. <laughs> it's going to be so hard. Oh, my gosh. Tom, what are you up to? You're always busy, busy, busy on two lights. Yeah. Well, I, first, I want to thank everybody watching Talk More Talk because it's really cool. I love when we like revisit or do another listen shows. You know, everybody goes back and they listen to those albums, too, and then they join in with the kind of conversation. Yeah. I really think that's really cool that, you know, that we can get people to go back and listen to something they may not have listened to for 20, 25, maybe even 30 years, you know, 40 years, if that, you know, so it's really cool that we can all share this, you know, um, you know, reimagine or not reimagining, but reappraisal of, yeah. of all these, uh, these albums that we go back and listen to. So thank you all for, for that. Um, on the two legs front, uh, two weeks ago, we'll, we released our episode with the editor, Dan, uh, Daryl easily on the record collector um um presents paul mccartney where it's just you know everything you know it's almost kind of like um uh ken's every little thing radio show i mean this this uh this magazine has every little thing regarding paul mccartney's solo career uh really cool a lot of great writers in there including our our, our friend uh, owen ling is featured uh uh, in the magazine as well. Uh, so, so check that episode out. We just did an episode that dropped this past weekend, uh, where we reacted to the Rob Sheffield 100, um, his opinion of the 100 greatest. We got to make sure we mention that his opinion of the 100 greatest, uh, Beatles solo songs. So we reacted to that and we gave our thoughts to, to that countdown. Um, this week we're hoping to, uh, record with, with, uh, with, um, Chip Mattinger and Mark Easter again. And we're going to probably talk about the tug of war pipes of peace, uh, sessions. So we look forward to that. And, uh, yeah, we're, I mean, we're already lining up shows for, for April. So yeah, we got a lot, a uh, lot going on. So please check us out on our YouTube channel, two legs, a Paul McCartney podcast, please 
subscribe uh, to that. Thank you, everybody, for listening to all the audio platforms. Wherever you listen or watch the show, it's highly appreciated. So subscribe here. Subscribe to Talk More Talk. Uh, Ken Michaels, Joe Mayo, all of us, and uh, and you'll have enough entertainment to uh, to suit you for for a uh, for a lunchtime. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Tom. You know, lunchtime. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Ken. What are you up to? You always have tons of stuff going on. Okay. First of all, things we said today, my other podcast, we just put up a show, which was actually our panel from the Fest for Beatle fans. And we had Adrian Sinclair with us, who is the co-author with Alan Coza of the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1. Volume 2 is supposed to be out December 10th. Um, anyway, so the panel was with Adrian Sinclair, and the topic was various locations that Paul recorded in with wings in the 70s so it's a really cool conversation thanks to andy nichols of two legs who recorded the whole thing so we we just posted it uh what did yeah today went up on youtube and um let's see we're going to be doing a new show next week we're going to be catching up <laughs> With the Red and the Blue album. Remember those? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You're kidding. Remix. <laughs> because Alan was out for... Oh, oh I'm yeah, sorry. We didn't have a, a new show there. And we're also going to right, be talking right. about the Band on the Run 50th anniversary, the underdub mixes. That's going to be next week. On my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, I just did a show with Al Sussman, where we went back to that magical week of April 4th, 1964, when the Beatles occupied the top five singles on Billboard's Hot 100 in America. One of the most incredible feats, maybe the most incredible feat that's ever been done on the charts. And so Al shared his memories of that time, as did I although I was only four and a half when all that was going on. But um, just remembering 1964, especially that first half of the year, what radio was like, and um, really enjoyable episode. It's nice to have somebody from that first generation who remembers things far more vividly than later generations. It's a completely different reaction. All the opinions that we hear from different generations are worthwhile, but it's nice to hear from people who experienced it when it was happening. So again, that's on Ken Michaels Radio. Please subscribe to that channel. Don't forget that my radio show, Every Little Thing, the easiest way to hear that show is by going to WFDU's website, Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey. They post the last two weeks that they aired on the radio station in their archives. So you have two weeks to hear each show um, after they air on the radio station. That's at WFDU.FM. Go to the archives page type in every little thing and the shows will be there and then finally there's my website kenmichaelsradio.com which um has loads of older interviews that i've done they're strictly audio interviews but you know i always bring up the the trivia contest that i have and there's great prizes to be given out with every contest there's a, a choice of one of 10 prizes either books it's mainly books these days. It's a Beatles library <laughs> on that page of different books uh, or CDs or DVDs. But there's lots of older interviews with uh, musicians and authors and uh, DJs and podcasters. You can find that all at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Hey, Ken, yeah. have, you, have you ever thought about uploading those uh, interviews to YouTube or just or do you just want to keep them on your website? I got a lot of deciding to do whether or not I want to keep the website, whether I want to give it a whole facelift on the website and keep it there, take it off. Uh, maybe at some point putting out a book with transcripts. Yep. Yeah, I've done, you know, I haven't quite made up my mind there. I don't know if, well, I mean, there's a lot of podcasts on YouTube that are strictly audio, so I could do that. Yeah. Uh, but then I don't want, I don't know if I want my, my website to be just a trivia website. I still want all the other stuff still on there. So, and I have other features on the website too, right. like concerts, upcoming concerts and upcoming releases and all. So for the time being, they're staying on the website and I still have a lot of deciding to do a lot of options. Huh. There you go. <laughs> Stay tuned. Stay tuned. All right. Thank you, Ken. Um, 
before I, I briefly mention what I'm up to, just want to say I forgot to mention, um, uh, Tom said about audio platforms, I forgot to mention that we at Talk More Talk are on virtually any every podcasting platform you can imagine, so you can find us there as well. Uh, as for me, uh, I was recently on uh, Plastic EPTV, I'm sure many of you are familiar with him, um, and he had a show that uh, uh, paid uh, sort of tribute, I guess you could say, to Ivor Davis. And uh, many of you know him from uh, his really great book, The Beatles and Me on Tour. And um, he's coming out with uh, an, a second edition, an anniversary edition of it. Uh, for him, it's the it's the 60th anniversary of, uh, thank you very much. Yep, there it is. The Thank you, Ken. The six in the mail. <laughs> oh, wow, excellent. The 60th anniversary edition um, of his his book. And so, uh, so Plastic EP had a show celebrating that and sort of celebrating Ivor as well. And so if you go to YouTube and search for uh, Plastic EP TV, I think that's the name of his channel, uh, yes, pla or I'm sorry, Plastic EP Live. Uh, you'll find it really fun show we did. Jude Kessler was on it, Terry Crane, um, many people you know, and, and we just had a blast. So uh, do check that out. Uh, Toppermost of the Poppermost, we have uh, another show out. Uh, it's continuing our look into February 1964 on the charts. And, um, you know, it's a we had to split it up into three parts because... Well, it's February 1964. I think you can wow. guess why. <laughs> it was lots and lots of songs to cover, both on the UK and US charts, because, of course, it's when the Beatles really broke it big. Um, uh, March episodes are coming very soon, and uh, we will start recording April next week. So to uh, catch up on all the episodes, just go to toppermostofthepoppermost.net. Uh, do check us out. We have a lot of fun on the show. It's been fascinating to trace the Beatles, rise on the charts, and also looking at other artists that were on the charts at the same time, those who were connected to the Beatles directly or influenced them. Um, it's just been a lot of fun. And uh, as Joe already mentioned, I'm going to be on Fab Gab on Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so hope you'll join us live to talk about Walls and Bridges. So I am super psyched about this show. So uh, I hope you'll join us to rank the tracks. So that's it for now. So thank you all once again for joining us for this uh, really fun episode tonight. Uh, we will be back next time with another great show. So for Ken Michaels, Tom Hanyadi, and Joe Mayo, this is Kid O'Toole saying we wish you peace in the neighborhood. Good night, everybody. Peace and love. Peace and love.